All right, welcome everybody to our first open mic night of 2023. I'm Jonathan Hupp, the executive director of our nonprofit Pat Conroy Literary Center. Very happy to host open mic each month in partnership with the South Carolina Writers Association, our statewide writers or organization. We've got folks joining in uh, here in the Zoom room from thus far five different states, which is a wonderful feature of our open mic night. Glad to have some new folks with us tonight and some returning uh, as well. Our featured author tonight who will be closing out our reading is James Davis May, author of the forthcoming poetry collection, Unusually Grand Ideas. Uh, and I will give a full introduction for Jim uh, when we get to that point in the evening. But right now to kick us off tonight is Abigail Summers is gonna read first and then Melissa St. Clair will be second. Uh, Sherry Thurner will be third. Helen Bradley will be fourth. So with that said, Abigail, uh, whenever you're ready, we're ready for you. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Abigail Summers. Um, I'm Zooming from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I'm going to read a poem that was published recently by Spillworks. I wrote this poem after hearing the song Into the Arctic. I picture the Arctic as a woman who spoke, but no one listened. The Arctic spoke. Icy water moved through her no longer solid. She cried, but no one could hear her. The ones that did only looked away. The heat was spreading and spreading, moving over her as she ran, but there was nowhere to go. This was her home, her life. She wept fearful tears. What a, she wept fearful tears of icy waters every day. Their eyes were closed, so closed. They only saw what they wanted to. Slow, nothing to worry about. Change, she called out, but no one could hear her. No one could see. Their eyes were closed, so closed. First, it was her arms as they reached to block the sun. Then, it was her legs as she could no longer run. Last, it was her heart as it broke apart and poured into an icy grave. The sea rose with great sadness. It toppled over trees and fields of green. She swept through their towns and over their lives. Change, she warned so long ago, but the world was sleeping. Their eyes were closed. Change, she whispered in the wind, but they were sleeping, sleeping, sleeping. And the next poem I'm going to read, um, is about a woman named Carol Adams having to leave her house after 50 plus years because she was forced to move into a retirement home. This piece is titled Stem by Stem, Vine by Vine. How would she ever say goodbye? The house is no longer her home, but it was a part of her. Together they grew. Stem by stem, vine by vine. Together they stood strong when the wind blew in. Together they fought hard when sickness was within. Together they were bound by stories and time. Together they stood until change hung from the vine. Like her, the floorboards squeaked. Like her, wrinkles and memories grew. Like her, colors had turned pale. And like her, it knew it too. Behind her, the door closed. One final time, she had to let go, stem by stem and vine by vine. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Beautifully read, Abigail. Thank you. Has the second piece been published? You mentioned the first one, but uh, has the second one been published as well? I'm hoping. I've submitted, but. We'll see. Excellent. Yeah. Melissa, we're ready for you next. 
Okay, good evening, Melissa Whiteford St. Clair coming in from Greenville, South Carolina. And since Monday, we will observe Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, this piece is around my journey uh, and social justice called Trajectory. Was your heart filled with dread? Did you turn your head? Unable to withstand the officer kneeling, he already had the upper hand. Did it leave you with an empty feeling? White privilege ego, a viral video. Roll back the film to the Jim Crow years. White mobs flocked in throngs to witness the same and jeer. If you couldn't bear to watch, did you hear? George Floyd calling for his mother near. The audio visual made this incident personal. I cannot unhear, unsee, a journey on the matter of race called to me, challenging and changing my life's trajectory. <clears throat> Thank you. And the second is for anyone who has a sleepless night called Voices. Voices, choices, scrolling through my mind, keeping me awake, some brutal, some kind, tossing, turning, counting numbered sheep, lifts, lists left undone, doubts and fears my reasoning can't outrun, restless, breathless, eyes wide open or pinched shut, inhale, exhale, ruminating rut, deliberate, wanton, out of my control. Next, please. People please, self-talk turning round, exhausted, voices quieted, finally sleeping sound. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> I always love listening to the rhythm of your poetry, the, the way that you deliver it just really comes through. Even 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 through the miracle of Zoom, it still translates through the screen. I appreciate that. You clearly had fun with that one. Yes. <laughs> you, could, you could hear it. Thank you. It got a lot of good feedback when I posted it on Facebook. A lot of people can relate, I think. So thank you. Yes. Sherry, would you like to read for us next? Yes, I kind of like to read. I'd like to pre tell you the story I told at the Detroit Moth. Um, I almost came in first place, but that doesn't count. So I still have to reach my life goal. Um, but it was the start of my first day of sixth grade and I was gonna be the winner because I read the most books and I was anticipating it, but the day wasn't starting so good. Sister had already put my friend up at the blackboard with her nose in a chalk circle for leaning sideways in our straight line. And she had smacked a boy across the face with the ruler, not the usual back of the head because he didn't know an answer. Mm -hmm. But when she called me to the desk, I was excited, I'm the winner. But the look of the face and with their fingers near the ruler, I knew this was not going to be the result. One of the things I've learned is I love to read. And from the time I could put a sentence together, I was addicted. It was my vice. And I learned to read upside down. And I saw my list. She had crossed out all 18 of my Cherry Ames nurse adventures. Oh. And I looked next to me and the class suck up. Her paper, she now was first, and she had read all saints' books. Uh -huh. I stopped reading them because there's no plot. You get sliced, you get diced, you may be getting buried alive, but as long as you forgive, you go to heaven and you're a saint. No plot. Sister handed me my paper back and said, Terry Ames was a Protestant and it didn't count. Oh. After school, I was so angry, but I remembered what my father taught me, take shit from no one. And I knew that included sisters now. 
And I thought of his other words of advice, make every punch count. And I ran as fast as I could and the bell rang and the doors opened to the public library and I inhaled them. I was in my sanctuary. The librarian checked my list and said, why are these crossed off? And I said, because they're Protestant. And she looked and she found that I had missed books at the beginning of the summer. She added them, initialed it with her beautiful script, wrote a note, put it in a sealed envelope and said, give this to your sister. <laughs> I knew she was a Protestant. So the next day I was able to slip the envelope onto the desk. The day was silence usual swath on the back of the head with the ruler, but nothing. And near the end of the day, we heard a rosary beads on her gown moving and we all tense because we didn't know who was the victim. And that would include staying after at this time, but she stood, turned and wrote all the names and the amount of books they had read. I was the winner. There was silence, nothing was said. I knew I was gonna pay a high price, but it was worth it. The ruler, the blackboard and I were good friends. But when those things happened, I tried to imagine the next chapter of my book or a book I had read in something that so moved me. And I was the winner. Thank you. <clears throat> I love listening to you share stories from your childhood. It's like one of the things I look forward to most when I see you pop up on screen because I know you're going to do one every time. Yeah, my childhood was unique and it was kind of like the little rascals in a way. You were on your own. <laughs> so did you say at the onset that you had performed that at the Detroit Moth? Yes, that's correct. I came in second. <clears throat> It's fantastic. The, Thank you. The moth founder, George Dawes Green, has been down. It's from school. Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. From the first moment I heard him on NPR years ago, I've been hooked on the moth. So next up on my list tonight is you, Helen. But before you read, let me forewarn Niles that he is going to be following you. And Shakima will be next, and uh, then Marty after that. Uh, so Helen, we're ready for you whenever you're ready for us. Okay, greetings from Savannah, Georgia, and a shout out to my hometown of Bethune, South Carolina. I'm Helen Bradley, and I'm excited that my debut novel, Breach of Trust, will be published May 21st by Moonshine Co. Publishing. And now I'm going to read the first page and a half of my novel. A silver moon shivers over the Atlantic as Anne and John sit on the deck of North Beach Grill. Ah, a perfect night. Happy anniversary, Anne says as she raises her Heineken bottle in a toast. John leans closer. Here's to many more, darling. When Anne's cell phone buzzes, John rolls his eyes. Ignore it. But Anne can't resist looking. It's Lisa. She's working at the ER tonight. Must be important. She taps her phone and puts it to her ear. Hey, Lisa. Anne, I hate to bother you after hours. Her friend speaks softly. I'm the charge nurse tonight. We've got a pregnant woman whose husband beat her up pretty bad. She has no family here. Can you please come see her? Anne sighs. No, I can't. John and I are celebrating our anniversary. You know the protocol. Call the police and they'll take her to safe shelter. Where's your social worker anyway? Swamped. Full moon crazy here. I told the victim about the shelter, but she doesn't want to go. She's anxious to get back to her toddler who's with the neighbor. Anne, you're such a great victim advocate. You can always calm people down and help them think clearly. Anne avoids eye contact with John, who's drumming his fingers on the table. 
<clears throat> Lisa. Excuse me. Ann avoids eye contact with John. Lisa, you know my program doesn't do 24-hour crisis response. It will take me 30 minutes to get to Savannah anyway, she says. Lisa talks fast. I know, but he punched her in the stomach. She could lose the baby. We need to monitor her for a while. I'll owe you big time. Where's her husband, Ann asks. They've arrested him. Damn, my pager's going off. Will you please come? Okay, just this once. Bye. Ann exhales. What was that all about, John asks. Lisa's freaking out about a domestic violence victims and wants me at the hospital. Huh, he says. Lisa's a nurse. She shouldn't be freaking out. But she is. She, have a, she has a soft spot for abuse victims. Remember, Lisa encouraged her sister to leave her husband, and when she did, he friggin' killed her. Lisa, she's got major guilt. John says, I know that, Anne, but it doesn't mean you need to bail on our anniversary, for God's sake. And we just started dinner. He stabs his flounder with a fork. Anne covers her plate with a napkin. Hun, would you get me a takeout box? John's blue eyes widen. Um, I suppose so. He reaches in his pocket for the car keys and slides them across the table. Good thing we don't live far away since I'll be walking home. Oh, darling, Anne says, I feel awful for leaving, but Lisa's always been there for me. It's not like I do this all the time, and hopefully I won't be gone long. I swear I'll make it up to you. She leans over and kisses her husband. John groans. Dang it, Anne, I wish you'd stop trying to save everybody. That's my first chapter. Thank you, Helen. Congratulations on the publication of your book, too. That's very exciting. Thanks. Congratulations. As a nurse, I uh, I like this. It's very good opening. So Helen will be back with us as our featured reader for Open Mic Night in June as well, just after the publication of our of her book. So we'll get to hear a little more from her then as well. So I'm glad you're able to join us tonight and give us a little preview. I really appreciate you doing that. Well, thanks for having me. I'm honored. Niles. Good to Hello. see you back, my friend. Thank you so much. Um, I have two micro flash pieces. I think I'll read if we if I don't run out of time. Uh, the first one is titled Flash in the Pan. It just came out a couple of weeks ago in Vestal Review, which, of course, as most of you know, is the oldest flash fiction magazine in the world. Uh, so I was tickled to have this come out. Flash in the pan. My first wife, Kat, rolled the dough in balls, flattened them, cut a hole in the center, and slid them in the hot grease, which created a flash in the pan, rolling smoke, popping grease, and bubbling that lasted until the dough reached a high temperature and turned brown. She then pulled them out with tongs, put them on paper towels to soak up the grease, and dried them before pouring a lemon and sugar mixture icing on top. Nothing beat her homemade donuts, not even a brain freezing strawberry daiquiri on a blazing hot day at the beach. As an engineer, I saw life in an unemotional mechanical way with an occasional flash in the pan. Cat, on the other hand, saw life mostly as mostly ordinary, except for emotional bursts of feeling on her timeline giving birth to our only son, birthday cake, occasional wine and sex, opening presents Christmas morning, salvation or baptism, and even death when one journeyed the tunnel to the light. When she journeyed after that train hit her Camry, at first I thought about her a lot. I wondered why her and not someone else. I wondered if she'd suffered. I wondered how I'd get by without her. I knew I'd never eat another donut like hers. Then I thought about her on special occasions, birthdays, anniversary, and Christmas. Once I was in Walmart, smelled her Chanel Number no. 5 perfume, and turned 
to look down the toilet paper aisle to see if she was there. I saw her one night when I dreamed I died. It seemed less mechanical, more fluid. I was in the pine box on display for others, looked at myself and thought I looked better dead than alive. The smile creases around my mouth were gone. The stress and worry wrinkles on my forehead from scrunching eyebrows had dissipated and the crow's feet around my eyes had smoothed. Whether death, death had relaxed my skin or whether the embalming fluid had filled me until smooth, I didn't know. But the suit and tie I'd worn once to Kat's funeral still looked good on me and my hair looked better smoothed down with gel. I hugged people who were there, some dead and some living, mostly cousins and friends from school I hadn't seen for 50 years. I never thought it was odd. I was both dead and alive. Cat was there sitting in the first pew and whispered to me, I told you it wasn't just a flash in the pan. Feel your life. I woke up, my pillow wet. I craved her donuts, called our son who works in IT, has his own family and lives on the West Coast and decided to stop by Walmart and asked the widow cashiered out for dinner. I love that so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the next one is a little more humorous, and I, I don't know, may, it may be, I shouldn't say this, but it is probably, um, I published it as flash fiction. It's coming out next month, I think, in a journal called Sage Cigarettes, which is out of Miami, uh, Florida. Uh, it's probably nonfiction more than fiction, but I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> it's titled Engagement Ring. It's very short. After I asked my girlfriend to marry me and she said, yes, I needed to get a ring. I didn't have the funds to purchase one without plunging into debt. And like my dad, who collected used pizza pans to give away for wedding gifts, my aunt, who recycled roadkill into art, and my grandmother who reused paper plates, cups, and tinfoil. I had been conditioned to be frugal, look for deals, and scan trash piles for treasures. I wondered if my aunts who had multiple marriages had kept their engagement rings. I called them, asked to borrow them, and they all said, hope it will bring you more luck than it did me. I told them I'd give them some money once my girlfriend made a choice. I unzipped the freezer bag, spread the treasures on the kitchen table. My girlfriend smiled, told me she appreciated my creativity, but she wanted her own ring, not one from one of my aunt's failed marriages. I understood her logic, appreciated her recognition of my frugality, and after taking out a high interest loan, I bought her a small quarter, quarter carat diamond set in yellow gold. I did not, however, tell her the flowers I wooed her with for months before our engagement had been ones I plucked from fresh arrangements placed on new graves in the cemetery. I knew the carnations, roses, and lilies would bring her more joy than the recently planted. <laughs> I hate to say that's mostly true, but it is. It tells you a lot, doesn't it? Thank you all very much. I'm in uh, outside Memphis, Tennessee, by the way. I really dig that one. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Just the whole way that you put that around and get to the flowers and the planted and the, yeah, it's very funny. Thank you. Perfectly executed, Niles. That's a wonderful short piece. My goodness. <laughs> um, and don't worry about anybody else finding out that it's true. We're definitely not live streaming or recording. So it's, it's totally fine. Totally don't, tell, fine. don't tell anyone. <laughs> Our secret. Shakima, would you like to read next for us? Yes. I am going to start with um, this short poem that I have called Elegy, Where One Must Have an Acre. Elegy, Where One Must Have an Acre to harrow a grave. I walk down by the bottle tree, its low hum quivering. I have not been here before, where the cardinals whipple. The old fence, my sandaled feet ashen, hands trailing, 
rust and honeysuckle. Mill sulfur welts my nose, mingles with the neighbor's burn barrel pepper clouds. The trees are partial, their rumors won't subside. Their magnolia congregation about these meeting rivers. My feet splintered across the train tracks, a dingy white undershirt left by an uncle whose blood was sweet, whose body fissured. The highway median between us, its yellow markings, a ruler in the bosom of an old engine. In grief, one cannot help but cross a line. I had some questions for the twin pines, splitting a ditch in the front yard, a hole where water once was, a history of digging. Okay. And thank you. And this next one um, is called Arrhythmia. Arrhythmia. I spent the summer I was nine on a Greyhound bus out of Brooklyn, fried chicken, Pepsi, and white bread on ice in a cooler tag private between my grandmother's feet. We arrived in Myrtle Beach after two and a half days in an old charter bus with the wrong name, graffitiing the landscape of sound with the screams of two sunburnt toddlers resting on their mother's breasts, dried milk on their chins. The back of the bus was its own land of mamas, wandering ravers, broken air vents, and sour toilet water. My uncle met us at the bus station on Joe White Boulevard, across from a Dixie mini golf and a Wendy's. He was a bondsman who played poker at his office, the heavy steel fans muting the men of his table, some friends, all indebted. He knew what it took for a man to earn a bad name. Box stores and plantations freckled Highway 17 south to Georgetown. My grandmother would introduce us, telling him about me, how I used to sing until my nose would bleed. We stopped for boiled peanuts outside of a Piggly Wiggly, and I heard a man playing Silent Night in August, soundtrack to the prodigal daughter's return. He was both court jester and king, rumored to be the money man of South Island bus stop, wanted to know if he could have a dollar. The false bells of the checkouts ringing, hot breakfast on the griddle, the scent of a country kitchen filled his nostrils defiantly, as if the last thing he would let another man take was his imagination. I would take his questionable music to heart on my way back to the hot leather, leather Cadillac, all the while swatting mosquitoes that had run off the river and toward the blood. Thank you. Wow. Oh, indeed. My goodness, Shakima. That, that was incredible. I absolutely love that. I, I kind of wish you could read it again. I want to drink all of that imagery mm. in. It Thanks was so much. So powerfully visual. Your, your descriptions of movement and of place and of people, all of that just resonates. It just kind of lingers. It's, it's so beautifully done. And you read very well, too. You deliver it well. Thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, Shakima is joining us from Georgetown, um, which uh, which she mentioned in the poems as well, but not in, in the course of her introduction. And it's great. There are two, two really wonderful poets in Georgetown I hope you have interacted with at some point. And if not, I can certainly help you do that. Uh, my friend Libby Bernadine, who is one of the uh, great matriarchs of South Carolina poetry at this point, uh, and Marlanda DeKine, who is uh, a slam poet and winner of the New Southern Voices Poetry Prize by our friends at Hub City Press. They've both been to see us in Beaufort recently, in fact, uh, and I'd be glad to connect you if you don't already know them. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, next on my list tonight is Marty, also a uh, joining us from far, far away. Uh, but before Marty reads, let me go through the rest of the list so I can forewarn others who are reading tonight. Uh, Diane, you will be next. Hi, Diane, you still with us? There you are. Yes, indeed. And uh, I think our friend Jane Zenger is about to join us. And if so, she will read after Diane. And then Elizabeth will be after her. So Marty, we are ready for you whenever you are ready. I'm about to read a piece of flash fiction. Growing up, the most awful events always happen during the summer. 
There was the tragedy when I was six. Mrs. Williams running from house to house, still wearing her pink apron. Trudy, is Kenny over at your place? Turning around, moving down Cutler Drive, crossing the street, running around again, running up to the Randazzo's ranch, banging on their door, and Mr. Randazzo, the big ball man who was always working on his Corvette, shaking his head, moving up and down the tree-lined suburban sidewalk. Kenny, has anyone seen my Kenny? Nothing. And then the screams from the O'Malley's backyard, the yellow colonial with the black shutters, the house with the swimming pool that no one other than the O'Malley's ever used. I thought nothing could be as horrible as what happened to little Kenny that day, but I was wrong. Three summers later, in the year I turned nine, my best friend Tommy saw me on my front lawn. Hey, why don't we set up a lemonade stand? It didn't take much convincing. Even my mom loved the idea. Oh, bless her soul. How her support of that lemonade stand tortured her, even through her final days at Gleason's assisted living facility. So we grabbed a snack table with a butterfly design and some metal folding chairs. Tommy found some poster board and some red, blue, and black markers and created our ice cold lemonade sign. Everything was set up on the sidewalk in front of our house and diagonally across from the O'Malley's Yellow Colonial. And the customers came fast that one and only day. I was the one who first saw the man in the dark blue Mustang. My mom was inside leaving Tommy and I to run things, but I remembered him. I helped the police with the description that day and in the weeks ahead. Sometimes what you love can go missing forever. The gold wedding band slipping from your finger into the waters off the Jersey shore. The beach, the peach cobbler recipe, handwritten in that beautiful cursive penmanship by your late mother. All gone, never to be recovered. He had a thick neck, crew cut blonde hair, square jaw, and a tattoo. He first showed it to me and then to Tommy the roadrunner on his right arm. He smiled, handed me a dollar, but he spoke to Tommy. Hey, little man, pour me a cup. The Mustang was idling as Tattoo Man slowly drank. You boys make some good lemonade. Those were the only words he spoke to me. The rest were directed to Tommy. I bet you are a big Yankees fan, am I right? Tommy nodded and smiled, yes, sir. Where was my mom? Why didn't big, bald Mr. Randazzo sense something was wrong instead of walking back into his garage? Why did the cars just keep driving past us instead of stopping to buy our ice cold lemonade on that awful day? And so the man leaned closer to Tommy. Follow me, big guy. I'll show you an autographed baseball I have from Mr. Mr. Mickey Mantle himself. 47 years later, I never recall a moment of hesitation as they walked side by side to the Mustang. The man said something to Tommy as he opened the passenger door. Tommy sat in the blue bucket seat, leaving the door open as the man took a seat behind the steering wheel. The car continued to idle as the man held a baseball in front of Tommy. Tommy, the biggest Yankee fan in our class. And so they sat in that car. No bell sounds from an ice cream truck approaching. No mothers with strollers walking past our lemonade stand. Just the back of Mr. Rendazzo as he took some more tools from the trunk of his Corvette. Tommy closed the car door, looked over at me, and gave a big smile as the blue Mustang slowly drove away. It's on hot summer days like today that for reasons I can't explain, I go down into my basement and open a closet door. I gently move away an old snack table with a butterfly design and remove a poster I keep inside a clear plastic bag, a poster with the words in red, blue, and black marker, ice cold lemonade. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, Marty. 
Thank you for sharing that tonight. Is that a published piece? Uh, it's not published yet. Um, open to suggestions, folks. <laughs> the way that you order the information in telling the story, it really makes it powerful. I it, like you. You know what's coming, but you, the, because of the way you order it, you don't understand the impact that it had on the narrator um, until the end. Oh, and that's really something. And, and it makes you want to know more. You want to know what happened and did he kill him? Did he go missing? You know, uh, and if you want to get um, assistance getting that published, send me a note. I'll be glad to connect you with some flash fiction folks that would be helpful. Thank you, Niles. I'll, uh, I'll work with Jonathan to see how to reach you, uh, or we can speak separately somehow. I'll, I'll put you two in contact. I was, thank you for suggesting that, Niles. So uh, I did not have to do it on your behalf, but uh, <laughs> that was that was what I was hoping would uh, would come out of this, uh, out of you both being on screen tonight as well. Yeah, all of you should connect with, I mean, I'd be happy to help anybody, but um, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn, so. Mm -hmm. connect with me thank you about every third post niles has on his facebook page is about some new publication uh that he's just been accepted into he is he has a remarkable talent and an understandable uh, understandably amazing reputation as a writer of flash fiction so he's an excellent resource for you marty i'll definitely connect you to a horrible reputation <laughs> <laughs> yes i mispronounced horrible sorry uh, for that uh, that that aside, Ma Marty, that you had about the lost wedding ring and and the recipe book, that's mm -hmm. just so well placed. That just that uh, really did a nice pit and then immediate immediate pivot back into the story as well. I really appreciated that in particular. Mm -hmm. So uh, Diane is going to read next. Our friend Jane Zinger has joined us. Hi, Jane. Welcome. Hey, I hey. apologize. I'm having some some technical. Uh, air problems and I got it fixed so I'm here sorry excellent I'm going to ask you to read after Diane Jane so Diane is next you'll follow her right. and uh, then Elizabeth Robin will be um, after Jane all right so that's our plan Diane we're ready for you okay thank you uh, these are two poems the first one is called the seduction she tricks me into noticing her decked out in white florals against the world of gray. Clamoring to be noticed, she beckons me to her pink blanket under the cherry tree. Her provocative invitation captivates my senses, jewels of daffodil yellow and tulip red. She tempts me away from my mind numbing screens, the Twitter twatter opinion of others enticing me from my cave with her magic. She lures me into the night to stargaze at black skies filled with meteorites. Sweet fragrant breezes of honeysuckle and lilac enchant me. Our long days stretch to eternity. I say gratefully, yes, yes, you are so beautiful. She says, I have always been here for you, longing for your attention. I needed to seduce you, she confesses. Soon I will be kidnapped by evil, evil forces. I need your help. You must love me with all your heart to save me from certain death. I love you to the moon. Hugs and kisses, spring. Wow. Okay. Um, and the next one is called The Tree Lady. May I come in? I had been instructed to ask first. Of course, you are welcome. The fragrance of freshly mowed greens greet me. I have only 10 minutes. On the advice of the tree lady, I made these plans to visit a park. Talk to the trees, she had said. Bizarre, but fascinating. First, I draw a focus card from her deck. It reads, Observe the color brown, 
all shades and variations, all textures and sensations. I see browns, patchy hues on bark and branches, in the grass threaded with straw mulch, on the fence mixed with shades of gray, reflections from a muddy puddle, and one brown leaf insistently rattling in the breeze, calling. The clamor of the solo leaf invites me over. IRSVP, visiting the otherwise green canopy of a young oak tree. May I hug you? I remember to ask. Certainly. Brushing away the cobwebs, no country girl I, uncertain if my bug spray will protect me, touch her slender, her, her slender timber, multicolored hazel textures, veins of sepia. The pine scent of a neighboring tree blows in. I feel foolish. Both hands rest on her trunk now. A strong gust moves through her dappled umbrella. Like an adamant object, she moves towards me, not just a lean, but a root straining advance. So like a step, I move back, startled. Collecting my wits, I touch her wooden base again. We sway to the rhythm of the fresh cerulean sky. I feel her aliveness. I connect with a full heart. Maybe the tree lady wasn't exactly crazy. The alarm on my iPhone rings, time to go. I hear the leaf rattle as I turn to leave. Come again, my friend, come again. Thank you, Diane. Beautifully read, beautifully read. What a range we're getting tonight, too. This has been really wonderful. My goodness. Jane, yes. are you ready for us? Yes. This is from Night Bloomer. Do that again? <laughs> it's from. Slow <clears throat> it down. Okay. There we go. Night, the Night Bloomer, the, the, the cactus. Uh, that's the name of the book. I'm going to do, it's a three-part poem and has an unusual name. It's called Blood. And um, this is uh, a little sequence that uh, happened uh, when uh, my husband was uh, on home in here with me and on his last, his last year. And uh, he stayed, I quit my job and stayed at home and he passed away a year and a half ago. But we have, uh, I never wrote a single poem about him in my whole life until he was dying. <laughs> and uh, he loved them all, thank goodness. But this one is called Blood, <clears throat> part one. When you love, the blood renews. When the blood stops, the child will soon come. When wounded, the lover brings the iodine and pours it on and tweezes your splinters after chopping wood and wraps your injured fingers in the emergency room. He counts the stitches and watches the clumsy intern. Your lover will bathe you and clean the blood from whatever source. Part two. Just this morning in the kitchen, the blade cut sudden and deep, the skin so surprised Surprised, it took a long moment to react. Nothing hurt at first, nothing at all. I was distracted by the other wound, knowing you are leaving me. Time and memories lost in your ripped mind. I search your eyes and for clues through the dementia, hoping for a shard, a bit of a broken mirror, reflecting the past no longer real to you. The deep out of the kitchen, the, the deep cut out of the kitchen knife is real. The pain brings me back to the present. The blood pours down my arm, sends me running to water, paper towels, bandage after bandage filling up. This one was to the bone. Pressure helps, the blood retreats. It's a funny thing about long lost love. 
what will be missed? The days of tubing on the Guadalupe River together with coolers and friends, that's over. The days of plotting out a garden with sticks and strings are over. It seems though that you remember every animal that shed on the rugs, the old truck, the blue, blue eyes of your daughter looking into yours at the moment of birth. So much is draining out, my love. I call out today from the kitchen where I am chopping potatoes and onions for the black bean soup you love so. You stare unresponsive for you no longer know me. Part three. Who writes about blood? The same one who writes about magic and love and rivers Sweet peppers and camping under the Mexican desert sky with stars so vivid we could see our naked bodies glowing with anticipation. In the Appalachian camping days, we showered off the semen and blood under soft waterfalls, remember? And in Alaska, the rainbow northern lights surrounded us like an alien landing. We wrapped ourselves in a blanket and leaned on the van, shivering, neck strained up, looking, turning into the splendid colors of the universe. That night, you remember, you, some nights you sometimes remember, but this day is gone before it happens. My wounds are of no consequence to you anymore. And our love is the empty shore after the hurricane. Thank you. Most of my poems are funny. Those aren't particularly funny. <laughs> well, but they were beautiful, Jane. Wow. Really, really well done. Are they are those in your book, Jane? The, yes, they are. Would, could you give us the title again? Yes. Can you see it's it's called Night Bloomer? Bloomer. And it's Jane Zinger, Z-E-N-G-E-R. We uh, had Jane down for a reading, actually with the aforementioned Libby Bernadine, not too long ago. And there's video recording of that on our YouTube uh, and our uh, on our Facebook page as well. Jane, we had, uh, I'm not sure if you know him, uh, I think a few of us here on the screen do, uh, Angelo Jeter, the, the poet laureate of Rock Hill, South Carolina, uh, and teach a workshop for us maybe a week ago at most called uh, Sticks and Stones, Turning Grief into Verse. Uh, and, and Angelo's story is that he is a, a young a widower uh, and has written beautifully and powerfully about that loss too. He would so appreciate those poems. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share that with him as well. Thank you. Thank you for reading that tonight and for and being if, with us. You know, if anybody wants a book, you, they, um... Uh, Jonathan knows how to get in touch with me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Elizabeth Robin, <laughs> I think we have come to you, my friend. Uh, I, I guess it's a segue. I, I wasn't really going to show this, but um, what happens after seven years, Jane, is that you end up with your third book about... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, yeah, it, uh, but it 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 does evolve in in ways I think that are positive and healthy and hopeful. So you have that to look forward to, I think. Um, but your work is beautiful. Um, I have a little piece. I've been thinking about um, my experience uh, years as as a teacher. Uh, and how every teacher knows that one of the things that's important when you set up a classroom is to set up your classroom in ways that create the communication among your students that you're looking for in any particular lesson plan. And I started thinking about shapes and I started thinking about how um, our society is just clunking along uh, into these little pockets of isolation that don't speak. And uh, I've been playing with this one, but I don't know. We'll see. Shapes shift. 
open the gates, build the town square into a circle. Those not chased in body or mind may slip in a circle, land in a triangle, trouble if someone feels exclusive or excluded. Love shacks crumble down, return to their rectangular foundation. But how is a rectangle not square? Stuck with corners, dust gathering. Why not three dimensions, an obelisk rising or a sphere under the influence orbiting inside moons? It's all about the angle one takes, isn't it? Can we knit together, slant sides this way, then that, like slash marks? Create fractions under what could be whole? Like a nonagon, circlish, but sided like arguments. A bumpy circle at best. Maybe the semicircle. Ah, yes. Keep one side open. Act as entrance or stage, a platform or essential escape hatch. Build that. Oh, awesome, Elizabeth. I could use an escape hatch every so often. I can relate to that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being with us uh, once again. So gang, that brings us to our featured reader for tonight, uh, James Davis May, who is the author of Unusually Grand Idea, forthcoming next month from Louisiana State University Press, LSU Press. His previous collection, Unquiet Things, uh, was also published by LSU Press in 2016 and was named runner-up for the Georgia Author of the Year Award in Poetry. His poems have appeared in Five Points, Guernica, the Missouri Review, New England Review, the New Republic, Southern Review, and elsewhere. In 2016, his poem, Ed Smith, won the Poetry Society of America's Cecil Hemley Award. Jim teaches English at Mercer University, where he also directs the creative writing program. And in 2021, he was recognized as a National Endowment for the Arts Fellow in Poetry. So it is an absolute honor to welcome Jim to our Zoom room and our open mic night tonight. And uh, we appreciate him braving uh, tornado weather where he is to stay online with us this evening also. So welcome, Jim. We're so glad you're with us. Well, thank you all for having me. I, I've, I made the mistake of writing on the, as you all were reading, I was writing notes and I can't really see my first poem very well right now. <laughs> but I'll, I'll move. I, um, really great to, to be with you all. And um, uh, just such moving work. Um, and uh, earlier when I was, uh, the lightning was sort of flashing in my face, which I thought would make for a great reading, but it sort of has gone away. So I don't think I'm going to be uh, lifted away. Um, but in honor of the tornado warning that we had, um, I'm going to open with a, um, a poem called Fish Rain. Uh, it's about those, I don't know if you've ever been online where you see uh, that um, uh, you know, the, their frogs have been falling from the sky or, or uh, uh, fish in this case. Um, but it's also um, my first book, uh, Unquiet Things, is a very, um, it's a book about wonder and, um, you know, I, uh, falling in love with my wife, uh, raising our daughter. And uh, my second book goes in a different direction. I, I uh, really struggled with depression a couple of years ago. And so it sort of address, addresses that. The title comes from one of the more pet poetic sounding side effects of antidepressants right there's dry mouth and um uh, insomnia but you also get maybe unusually grand ideas and i thought those would be fun um but anyways uh this is fish rain so this is sort of a comment on wonder and uh, i'll move through uh, from there fish rain it's rare but it happens a water spout forms near land and raptures the fish to the sky we're not quite sure what happens next well, we know that many die, that some are shredded by the winds, that some are frozen into chunks of ice, and that some, some survive even after the cyclone stops and they exist up there a while. 
Maybe they're pummeled but supported by the currents and the clouds, the way you keep a tennis ball in the air with a single racket, kept up until they aren't and fall. And even then, some survive to drown on land. What must it be like to die after that ascension, before life was so much hunger and short-lived satisfaction, but mostly buoyancy without knowing that word or any word? Yes, they're stunned, but surely they know or sense something is ending. One eye focused on the ground, the other on the lost sky, and the water an absence, a memory they can't remember, while that human sound of wonder starts up when they're found and can't, I imagine, help. Um, another sort of poem about sea life, um, my wife, um, who, and I have, I have to thank my daughter too, who's in the other room, she's in fifth grade, and my wife is also a poet off doing some poetry things. And she was like, oh, what are we doing tonight? And I said, I'm doing a poetry reading. <laughs> she wasn't very thrilled about that. Uh, she, I think she was hoping for watching Netflix or something. Um, but my wife is from Miami and um, uh, I'm from Pittsburgh. And I should say too, I'm, I'm uh, tuning in from Maine. But uh, does anyone know what a, the, it's not quite a jellyfish, but it's called a Portuguese man of war. Has anyone ever seen these? They're beautiful. and um, we were walking on um, Miami Beach actually one day and I, I saw them and I thought they were beautiful. And my wife's like, don't touch those, don't right. touch those. Um, so this is about that. Um, my first book, I said it's about depression or my second book is about depression, but it also really begins with a series of, um, I think grief um, losses. Um, many of my, I just had a really horrible couple of years of losing um, um, teachers, mentors, um, friends. Uh, um, and so this one's about a, um, uh, uh, a, a, a poet who hadn't, hadn't quite passed away, but we knew it was going to pass away. So this is Portuguese man of war. I don't imagine pain, but I do feel a sadness watching it throb on the sand like a blanket with a mouse inside. Mauve, shriveled, it reminds me of the birthday balloon my daughter wouldn't let me throw away, how it sank each day for weeks, weighed to the floor by its own weight, or rather its failure to transcend that weight. Something of blown glass to this shape, or something neural, a brain and its nerves, and only that, what it might, like, what it might be like to be a mind without a body, instead of a body without a mind, which may be the case right now for the poet who's been in a coma for days and will die soon. Maybe the mind just drifts away, like these animals that drift with the weather and the tide, the tide and time that shred them as they reach the shore. Look at this one, its sail translucent, its inky tentacles taut as a line of verse. After the thing dies, they go on, stinging whatever touches them. And thank you. Um, in that vein, um, uh, this is again is about, um, sort of the aftermath, finding out a, a friend had passed away. Um, it's called uh, Red in Tooth and Claw, a, a little nod to uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Even on the night my friend died, after a long illness, I won't use the word battle, but the cancer was gone and then it came back like some slasher film killer. Even on that night, the feral cat the one that's white and fluffy and sometimes affectionate, still crossed our driveway quietly from our neighbor's pines to our rhododendrons. Even on that night, she would look for some rodent or bird to terrorize and mangle and maybe fully kill. And I, drinking and grieving on our deck, was appalled by the world and its gross refusal to stop being the world, and then embarrassed not just by my own naivety, though there's plenty of that, but by, but by my innate human sickness that believes we matter, that someone is listening, that civility isn't just something we imagined and don't really follow anyway. That night, I wanted everything to be better than it is. So I went to the fridge, got out the milk, and poured it into a little bowl, which I left on the porch and found empty the next morning. 
the goal, by the way, is to go up at some point. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be happier at some point. Uh, last poem, anyways. Um, yeah, we, we'll get there. Uh, this poem is, uh, I, I had this odd experience about one of the people, actually, that um, uh, some of these poems are about of um, years, or not years, a few months after uh, he passed away, I got an email from him. And it was, I got excited for a second, but it turned out to just be spam, like the account was hacked. And um, so this is called um, Spam from the Dead. And two months after the cancer finally ate through the last tissues that separated him from death, I got a message from his email address urging me to click on a link I know I shouldn't, though I'm tempted. I really am, to see where it takes me, to see if ghosts haunt the internet the way we half hope they haunt our lives. That is kindly, reassuringly. Reassuringly because if they exist after death, maybe, just maybe, we will too. But I know better and don't click on anything, though after I delete it, I search for and read the last message he sent. Dear Jim, I'm back home now. Thank you for letting me visit. Please tell everyone else I was glad to meet them and let me know if I can do anything in the future. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan mentioned uh, my poem, Ed Smith. I'm gonna read that next. Um, it's about uh, the sort of background about it is, uh, uh, we now live in Macon, Georgia, which is, if you don't know, it's in the middle of the state and uh, the home of uh, Otis Redding and Little Richard. It's, you know, um, I, so it's got a great traditional uh, uh, musical tradition. Um, but prior to that, it's also very, very hot in the summer. And hearing where many of you are from, I know uh, you, I, I, you, you, you feel my pain. Um, but prior to that, we lived for uh, about five years up in the Georgia mountains in a little town called Blairsville, Georgia, near Blue Ridge. Um, beautiful, beautiful place. And we moved, we had moved up there from Atlanta. And when we got up there, um, you know, my wife and I are both poets. And I see, um, you know, I see a deer one day and I write my deer poem. I see turkey the next. I write my turkey poem. I see owls. I write my owl poems. And at one point, uh, Chelsea, my wife said, no more critter poems. <laughs> none, none. Okay, so um, then this, uh, what happens here next is uh, a, a man who with dementia uh, walks into our, our yard and um, it's sort of, th this is the story of that uh, experience. So uh, this is Ed Smith. Instead of deer or turkey in the yard, this morning we find Ed Smith, or a man who says he's Ed Smith. Elderly, dressed in a khaki jacket and pants with a white polo tucked partially into his belt. He sits beside me now on our deck, while inside my wife calls the sheriff to see if anyone is looking for him. No one is. He knows nothing except the name, not even how he got here or why he would be walking at all just after sunrise. I ask him if he saw the cows in the meadow along the roadside, and he says no, that he didn't come that way, but I know it's the only way he could have come. I ask him if he's married, and he says no, then maybe, and I catch myself manufacturing a sort of condescending pity, condescending in the way that all pity is, thinking of him as a body with no self, a ghost in reverse, an orphan memory of someone else's grandfather now lost and unaware that no one knows who he is, including himself. In the old stories, the dead forget themselves and walk witless through the underworld like boats adrift and pilotless. And maybe that's why we invented the self or the soul or the spirit, some indelible quiddity that cannot die because this, to be forgotten by everyone, even our own minds, seemed and is inexcusable, the worst sort of indignity. But maybe the spell will break and the hero will return, however briefly, to talk with the sheriff who'd otherwise be bored this Sunday in a county where nothing happens except for things like this. Maybe a wife will be found or a son or a daughter who will laugh when picking him up, the laugh, the acceptance of what cannot be changed. So my wife and I wait for that someone who will know what to do, leaving Ed Smith to sit quietly in our chair without questions, 
his hand tapping his knee to the rhythm of a song that he's remembered or imagined and isn't there, but seems to be beautiful. Hmm. And uh, this is more about uh, now moving more towards uh, uh, poems about depression. Um, again, <laughs> sorry about the sort of uh, uh, somber uh, material. Um, this is called out too far. I think it is self-explanatory. Home from work, he's taken off his coat, turned off the light and lain in bed alone as he has done for months. Though it's only five o'clock or so and his wife and daughter are downstairs wondering why he's not with them. His wife, he'll, found out, he'll find out later, is worried he hates them. How to tell her that he sometimes doesn't know how he's ended up in bed, that he's not sleeping or even thinking, that he's gasping, and that's about it, that his day has been moving toward this moment, the dark room, a piece of driftwood for an unskilled swimmer who's gone out too far and pauses to gauge the distance he knows is likely to kill him. Still, through that distance, he can hear voices he loves wondering where he is. Um, a couple of years ago, um, we went to, this is right uh, before uh, COVID hit, um, we went to uh, France and um, up to Brittany um, and stayed in a little town called, and I mentioned this in the poem, my French is not good, uh, Saint-Mouin de Um Does anyone speak French here? Terrific. <laughs> um, so uh, we were there and it, it, one of the most beautiful places I've, I've ever been. The, the uh, tides are very extreme, um, but um, absolutely beautiful. We could look across the bay and see um, Mount St. Michel um, looming in the distance. It was absolutely beautiful, but I also had a bout of depression. So it's this sort of weird feeling of your experience, your, your location, everyone around you can be wonderful and great, something's just not right. So um, so yes, this is a little bit longer, depression in Saint-Mouin de Leon. The donkey my daughter loves cannot reach the flowers that grow in the film of soil the ocean breeze has lifted to the roof of the barn. We don't know what they're called and speak too little of the language to ask the farmhand their name, though we can tell they're delicious by the way the donkey cocks its head to two o'clock toward the roof and strains its prehensile lips to almost reach them. An effort that looks like remembering a word you can almost recall, how it nearly touches the voice. It's on the tip of my tongue, we say. And I don't know what to say to myself or the man I become inside those days and nights of hurt I cannot argue my way out of. I know it won't be enough to say, remember the orchard over there, it's plums and cherries and apples just forming from the blooms. Not enough to remember the tides we hear beyond the meadow, how they leave the beach cracked like ancient porcelain. Not enough to repeat the Auden lines I muttered to myself last night at the restaurant when I felt the depression coming on, eerie as a, as a suspicion of being watched. The lights must never go out, I said. The music must always play. And it almost worked. The intoxication of asking for and receiving the tray of oysters gleaming like an ornate clock, then the bouquet of mussels and the baked sea and the baked sea bream symmetrical as a well-wrapped Christmas gift. But I've learned that you can love pleasure and still want to die while absolutely not wanting to die. A situation that requires, if nothing else, some patience the precise gentleness the donkey grants my daughter's hand as she offers the wanted flowers to the mouth that craves and destroys them. <laughs> and this is the my last poem. Um, and I promised something uplifting. I think this is a little bit more uplifting and it goes back to flowers. Um, let me get a, a little drink here though. This is called uh, Moonflowers and uh, a couple of years ago, when I, we were up in the mountains, um, a good friend of mine who's a, 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 was a colleague in the English department um, and a, a, just a terrific gardener. He's a terrific gardener, but he does not like to eat vegetables. It's very 
I think his wife is a vegetarian, right? But he planted moonflowers um, and they started to come up and he said, well, let's have a moonflower party, which I'd never heard of. Uh, maybe he just invented them, but we just sat around and watched the the moonflowers sort of open up, um, and it was it was beautiful. And my daughter, of course, loved this. She was uh, probably maybe in second grade at the time, just running around and letting us know. So this is called Moonflowers. Thank you so much for um, uh, having me. And 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 um, here it is, Moonflowers. Tonight at dusk, we linger by the fence around the garden watching the wound husks of moonflowers unclench themselves slowly, almost too slow for us to see they're moving. You notice only when you look away and back until the bloom decides, or seems to decide, the tease is over and throws its petals backward like a sail in wind. A suddenness about this as though it screams, almost the way a newborn screams at pain and want and cold. And I still hear that cry and the shout across the garden to say another flower is about to break. I go to where my daughter stands, flowers strung across the vine like Christmas lights, one not yet lit. We praise the world by making others see what we see. So she points and feels it must be pride when the bloom unlocks itself from itself. And then she turns to look at me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Wow, it's quite uh, quite the journey we went on there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, <laughs> gang. Other responses, Melissa, Elizabeth. You do such an amazing job of of sketching the theme, um, and you have these interesting metaphors that you use that are powerful but what really kills me is the way you you end it every one of your endings is like perfect how do you do that <laughs> thank you I'm, I'm thinking of uh one of my actually one of the professors who's uh, mentioned in the po uh and uh, these poems are about he once said uh he said you know your endings are so great it's kind of why can't you make the, all the poem like the ending? <laughs> it's like the, the idea about why can't we make the entire airplane like the black box? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, thank you. I, I don't I, I don't know. I, I, I should say that um, having my wife, who's a terrific editor and my first reader, really uh, helps uh, with that. So um, but thank you. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> No, you didn't give away any secrets. <laughs> well, <they don't. laughs> I was hoping. <laughs> no, and for me, the cat lady in me loved the uh, inclusion of the feral cat, but I love that it was white and ghost-like and that the milk disappeared. So that was wonderful. Thank you. I'm, I'm allergic to cats, though oh. I, I don't want to be. And uh, my daughter really doesn't want me to be allergic to cats. So we have a dog, um, but um, feral cats are sort of the way my daughter can, or neighborhood cats, let's say, my daughter can have her cat time. So. Your line, um, love pleasure, but still want to die. I, I, I just think it's, I can't think of a word for it. But as a long-term hospice nurse, I think that could fit a lot of my patients. Mm -hmm. But thank you for sharing it. It just was very moving. Uh, thank you. And um, you know, thank you for doing that work. I have a, a, a good friend, a poet named uh, Michael Mark, who actually has a terrific chap chap book up that won the Rattle Prize. He also does hospice work. And I just talking to him, I know it's really um, great work that you're doing. Any other comments or questions for Jim or for anybody else? We're, we're now to that point in the evening where our uh, conversation and exchange is certainly welcome. Well, this is my first time attending this event. Uh, really enjoyed it. I mean, uh, I, I got to experience lots of different pieces of wonderful writing. So thank you. Yes, Thank I was just.
so yeah. we're just thrilled to be here amongst these wonderful writers. It's it's inspiring. It is. It's uh, it's such a wonderful opportunity to bring together voices and genres and different levels of experience and published and unpublished and folks who don't necessarily even want to be published, but but love the craft of doing it, love being a storyteller in whatever way makes sense for them, uh, and to get to share all of that uh, with each other and also with our with our multiple audiences who will encounter the live stream and the video afterwards. It's it's really special for us to get to do this and. It's a wonderful partnership with South Carolina Writers Association that helps make all this possible. Next month, February, uh, we're going to do something we haven't done in a long, long time, and that is have an in-person open mic uh, in Beaufort, just up the street from our Conroy Center. Yay! With our friends and neighbors, the <laughs> uh, Beaufort Black County, Beaufort County Black Chamber of Commerce. Excuse me. Uh, so we'll be uh, on their lower level in Sandy's, their restaurant space, with Lola Campbell who is a, um, a poet from Hilton Head, who Robin knows, right? You've met Lola as well. So you and I may be the only two people on screen who have at this point, but uh, we're excited to share uh, Lola's voice with every, everybody. So what we'll be doing this year moving forward, gang, is we will be having our virtual open mic every other month. So in the odd numbered months, we'll be doing this. And all of you who are on our list will continue to get announcements and be able to sign up for that. And then on the even numbered months, at least for the next couple of months, uh, we'll be doing this as an in-person event, also live streamed, but at least in February, not with a Zoom component. Uh, maybe we'll figure out how to do a Zoom component with the in-person open mic and make it all one thing, but one step at a time. How about that? One step at a time, gang. Uh, in the meantime, this, this has been really special, a wonderful way to kick off the new year with open mic. So I thank each and every one of you for being with us. And special thanks to Jim for being with us tonight as our as our featured guest uh, writer as well. Thank you all, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you for continuing to do this, Jonathan. You are welcome, Rob. And you do one on Hilton Head as well. So you know what it takes to do these and, and to do them well. Uh, and it's an honor to get to serve in that role. So everybody, uh, thanks one final time and good night to you all. I'll hope to see y'all again soon. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night.